Hello and welcome to Extreme Academy Live. This is where you come to advance your knowledge, advance your skills and advance your prospects. Thanks for advancing with us. This is week four, we're, we're halfway through, can you believe it? Um, now remember, once you get to the end of this series of live streams, you'll be able to take an exam. If you pass the exam, then you'll get a certificate, a digital badge. It'll be a certification from Extreme Networks that says that you understand how to build secure and robust wireless networks. You'll be able to share that into your, into your social group and use it to help you advance your career. Now this week we were due to have a guest, but we weren't able to line everything up. So we, we've, we've, we've changed the order slightly, so that's gonna come uh, in future weeks. This week is all about design. And design is a fantastic subject. It's, you know, if you understand this and if you understand best practices of design, then you're gonna be one of the designers of the future. You're gonna be designing systems, designing networks that support business needs and transformation in the areas they're being used. And you'll be the one that's designing the future. How exciting is that? So Isaac, you know, come, 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 you know, come in, let's bring Isaac in. Tell us more about that. What is design and why is it so important? Hey Rowan, hi. Look, 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 I've had a haircut, finally. <laughs> I don't oh, have to wow, wear, Isaac. I, I don't have to wear the cap anymore to look like a hooligan. I don't know if you saw on LinkedIn. <laughs> I had <laughs> going all over the place. Now I can feel normal again. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Um, yes, week four, so exciting. Uh, the amount of feedback we're getting is really phenomenal. Rowan, um, designing, designing, designing. Right. I wish. I wish when I ran my business in South Africa, networking business. I wish. I had known the stuff that I'm going to be teaching today. This stuff is so valuable. This is gold. We are giving you gold today. We are telling you how enterprise customers, how they think when they purchase, the decisions they go through, the things they look out for. If I had known half of this, I would have been 10 times, 10 times as successful as what I was. You know, it's a lot of it, it both sessions today are taken up by design but it is a big really big topic but because we want to help because we say we want people to advance with us it's not this is not just for entrepreneurs right if you're running your own business and you want to start off or whatever this is really going to help you but if you're in the industry and you're involved in a team about that that talks about design and and networks and stuff this is for you the other thing that's so interesting is today we're going to be looking at the even different types of careers right who would have thought that designing a network is going to need project management skills maybe that's you know where you are strong project management we'll show you how that role can fit into advancing your future with us implementers people who go out and do installations of networks and things like that so it's really really interesting i i, I it's different to last week last week was quite technical um and and i know there's a lot of techies on here but this stuff if you can marry the tech stuff with this stuff the knowledge of how to sell networking gear and solutions and design them properly fantastic um it, it's going to be a really great one i'm excited uh, about this one anyway rowan uh our production meeting right there was a couple of things that came out at our production meeting from last week you want to take uh, you want to take that yeah sure the uh we, we, there was a conversation going on on the chat window last week which was which was great we uh uh somebody asked the question whether we should uh extend the extreme academy community into discord i think it was a red mile shark so big shout out to you thanks for thanks for putting that in the chat window and a number of you said uh in response to that you'd be interested in joining that uh, discord community as well and we've been thinking about that we've been thinking about we are what, what you know how do we extend the community? Should we should we use more meeting polls? You know, how, how do we use all these different tools to, you know, to enhance what we're doing? And we we kind of had this inkling that that maybe we should should get into Discord, and that really prompted us to to you know to go and do it. So we are going to do it. I just want to let everybody know that that's happening. We're doing some things in the background to do with community rules. Um, if you don't know what Discord is then uh, if you're like me and you've got some teenage children, go and ask them. 
because they'll they'll tell you they'll tell you what it is. Um, if you don't if you don't have uh, teenage children, then um, then go on the internet. You can uh, you can go and search and find out what it is. Or you're probably or you know if you know what it is, you're probably using it already in, in many other things, and you know how useful it can be. So a few things we need to do in the background. Uh, some of you have, have come forward and said that you're willing to be moderators, which is fantastic. We really appreciate that. So so we'll be having some uh, some offline conversations with you about that. So what we're hoping to do is with, within the next week, uh, we will announce the details on how to join. So stay tuned for that. And we think it's going to be a fantastic enhancement to the Extreme Academy community. So. We're ready to go now. Just one last thing from me. That's just a reminder that uh, if you've got any questions, then we've got extreme engineers available to answer any questions you've got in Meeting Pulse. So the QR code will be over my shoulder and the URL on the screen somewhere. So you can ask your questions there. You can answer other people's questions. We'll be doing some polls just for some fun. So make sure you've got that running. And uh, Isaac, we're ready to go now. So let's take it away. Let's start week four. Thank you, Rowan. Hey, before I start teaching, I want to show you a little clip. I know we've seen it a couple of times before, but I want to show you a little clip to show you design in action, an outdoor music concert. You can't just turn up and plug in APs and hope things work. Design in action. Take a look. Ga ik terug naar 1997, naar de eerste editie, waarbij we met een grapje zijn begonnen. In de zin van, we gaan in een weiland een beetje crossen en dan gaan we een feesttentje naast zetten. En dat was zo'n succes. We kregen de smaak te pakken. We wilden groeien, we wilden meer. En zo is het festival heel langzaam gegroeid. Zwarte Cross is one of the largest outdoor music and sports festivals in Europe. We uh, have been providing the Wi-Fi network uh, really to offload the data from the public 3G, 4G network. Together with our partner Indicium, we're trying to uh, enhance the user experience. Via realiseren is eigenlijk het hele draadloze en bekabelde netwerk. Wat het grote voordeel hiervan is, is dat de veiligheid uh, geborgd is. En daarnaast zien we dan ook dat mensen 4G gaan gebruiken. Er is een mix eigenlijk van 4G and draadloos netwerk gebruik. Imagine a green field where cows are feeding themselves for 144 acres and you have to set up a, a, an event, including so much IT as we do here at Zwarte Cross. You have to have a lot of glass fiber to host people, to scan 2,000 people per gate per hour. So we have nine gates, yeah, 80,000 people are able to enter in the area. Those are challenges because there's nothing here. This year introduced a few new uh, analytic systems that Swartacross is using to understand uh, what are the trends on the network, uh, what are the issues on the network, or how the network is performing during the festival days and before. What it does effectively is it looks into all of the traffic for all of the clients, what they're doing, when they're doing, and how much tra traffic they, they push, what applications they use. So you can see that the network response and application response is very stable. This is, of course, a great hospitality event. We're providing the best connectivity in festivals like this because people more and more want to be connected, connected with the people at home, their friends, their family, and we can help the organization there to give all the visitors better experience. So for this year, um, we are also providing our extreme guest solution. When they connect to the free Wi-Fi uh, network here at Swarte Cross, they get a nice splash space uh, where they can just click on uh, accept and connect. They are moving all the time. And this is what we can understand here as the dwell times by the hour of the day, by the day of the week. We know how many of them are new users that just came in today, how many of them are have registered, for example, yesterday, and this is the returning, returning connection. Last year we did about five terabyte of data transfer uh, across our Wi-Fi into the internet. I'm very, very glad to have a technical partner like Extreme Network to help us solve these issues we encounter every year. Je wil weten waar mensen uithangen, je wil weten hoe mensen zich registreren, je wil weten hoe voorraden worden bijgehouden. Dat betekent dat de techniek eigenlijk onmisbaar is. Sterker nog, als de techniek uitvalt, kunnen we haast niets meer. Hebben we een partner, 
Extreme Networks die ons daarbij ondersteunt. En daar zijn we ontzettend trots op, want daardoor hebben we het wel voor elkaar om voor iedereen dit hele mooie feest mogelijk te maken. So, design best practices, right? Like always, I try and read the learning objectives because it's really difficult to, to memorize all of these uh, things. But this is what we're going to aim for today. We're going to aim for understanding how we plan for wireless deployments. Okay, so you part of a team you have acquired a new customer and the customer has asked you to install a wireless network okay so that could be one use case another one could be um, you've been called in uh, your company uh, has been called in to help a customer a school because they're having lots of trouble with their wireless networks and their current supplier or vendor or provider really doesn't know what they're doing okay and so you've been called in to look at this and redesign this and see if you can add any skill. So planning wireless deployments, enterprise deployments specifically. So not so much targeted at the home. The next thing is work breakdown structure. This is where you take a big problem and you, <clears throat> you make it into small little problems and you attack these small little problems and solve them all. Sometimes you might be, like I say, called in to go do the project at the school and you look at it and it's a nightmare. Five classrooms, the wireless is a mess, all of these things. I'm going to show you, if you use the methodology we will teach you today, how you can take, uh, create a, a work breakdown structure to help you make all of these big things, turn them into manageable tasks that you can attack one at a time to be able to get you to the point of creating this great network. The next one is defining requirements, right? So of course, you've got to identify what's going on on a network, or if it's a greenfield, greenfield means new from scratch, uh, and, uh, deployment, um, Define what the requirements are. You know, the customer wants you to put wireless access points. Okay, but I need to understand. You need to understand what the requirements are. This was something I didn't always do at when I was running my own business. Customer said, I want a wireless network. No problem. I'll put up a wireless network. I, it, it was more than that. To be successful, I should have done more than that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Wi-Fi considerations um, or, or radio frequency considerations when we're talking about Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11.ax. So in wireless networks, access points, by the way, one of the guys back in the office said to me, please tell people, please tell your students not to call them wireless access points because that's WAP and WAP actually is a is an acronym for a very um, weak form of encryption, the original form of encryption. So he said to me, make sure you call them just access points. Got your Nile, access points. So access points are often placed in the network with no planning, right? No planning. You you walk into an office or you go into your home and you put in your access point wherever that wire from the from the your your ISP or from your telco, wherever it comes into your house, right? If if the if the wire happens to come into your bathroom, well, well plug plug in the access point in your bathroom, right? If it comes into your lounge, you just plug it into the lounge, right? We tend to do that in our home networks, we just plug it in wherever it's convenient without thinking about it. And same happens for office. Don't think that this is only for home. This also happens for office. People who don't know networking, who don't know wireless, they do the same thing. They come into a room, they look around it's like, oh, there's a gap there. We, let's put it over there. They don't properly consider where you're going to be doing this, right? Oh, well, next to the uh, let's let's put it next to the microwave oven because there's a PowerPoint over here and there's there's a telephone socket over here. Those are the types of things you might be laughing, you might be joking. It really happens. These things are real. Extreme um, 
learns a lot from our partners. We've seen a lot. We've been called into many, many situations to fix wireless networks that are a disaster, uh, you know, by because people came in, didn't know what they were doing, and it's really mission critical. So we're not talking to you because, you know, we don't, you know, just think in eventing. This stuff happens. This really happens. And we really want to help you so that in Academy, you can learn to be a decent, a good engineer. So most of the times, the incorrect setting up of wireless networks is done because the discipline of planning is not there. The discipline of planning, the discipline of taking your time to do things properly. I know one of the biggest pressures that I faced was, hey, we need the wireless network tomorrow, right? We, we need it in tomorrow. We need it by, by Wednesday. You, you have to have it in place. That creates a problem, right? There's this balance about, well, I should be planning as opposed, oh, let me just go and install it so that the customer is happy. If you don't plan, you will fail. If you don't plan, your wireless network might work at first, but it will cost you pain and misery and money. It will. It's, it's not an if. It will. You have to do these things properly. Access points, like we mentioned earlier, um, have a lot of intelligence built into them. So it's like you can put it down and it'll work because it knows how to do it. And if it detects a second access point, it kind of knows how to talk to one another to make sure that there's no interference, to make sure that they work well. But don't let that make you think that you don't need to plan, okay? You have to plan. Right, so design this user experience. You've all seen a slide that looks like this, a meme that looks something like this, right? Um, you could design something, right? Beautiful path. Oh, lovely. Look at this. You know, there's there's a lovely path going uh, you know, up here. You could, as a, as a designer, you could do that and then find that the users do something completely different to what you had designed. This is part of the planning process, right? You design a wireless network, you or you don't design it. You, you just, yeah, let's say you design, you design a wireless network, you put a couple of access points, but you've done it in such a bad way that there's weak signal in many areas. What do your users do? Right? They need to work. They need to move laptops around. They need to go to different offices. Your planning has been poor. You designed it, but you didn't design it well. What do your users do? They bring in their mobile phones. They create hotspots and they connect the laptop to, to hotspots. Right? That's what they do. These shortcuts. That's what they do. So this is why planning is so very, very important. So... When you deploy a wireless LAN, we're going to be talking about steps, right? Or phases, if you want to call it. Steps that you need to go through when designing a wireless network. Things that you have to think about, that you have to plan, right? It would be very good if you took a note paper, if you have a note, you know, uh, a tablet, something that, you, that you're writing this. The other thing that I would honestly suggest that you do is... I know there were complaints about the sizes of the of the the uh, the slides and things like that. But today, as I go through these slides, they build out. So some of them, you know, I have to click two, three, four times, and then and then they they build out. When a slide is built out, I will tell you, okay, this is built out. Take a screenshot. At that point, go in, take the screenshot so that you can capture all the data that's on there. I'm going to give you homework regarding uh, this stuff. So when you deploy a wireless LAN, it's really important to, um, to, to plan and execute the project, right? So you need to create a project plan. What is the project plan? You've heard of this term project manager. A project manager is exactly that. It is somebody who manages a project. What you're going to do here 
is you're going to create a project. You'll see as we go along, we're going to get to a stage where we're going to talk about different roles. Now, again, one of the things, if we can just go back a step or two is, in project, what we're doing uh, today, the content that we're going to cover today is really about enterprise. What are we saying enterprise? What do we mean by enterprise? We're talking about large corporate deployments. Now, you might say, well, but I work for a small company. Well, scale changes. Principles are the same. If you get the discipline, if you get into the discipline of planning, when you do small projects, a 5 AP rollout, a 10 AP rollout, even a 3 AP rollout, if you get into the discipline of planning things, creating a project plan, when the project is small, then that discipline you will maintain and develop and hone and perfect as you scale up, as your project plans get better or bigger. And that's the ultimate game, right? That's the ultimate, that's what we're aiming for. The ultimate goal over here is I'm going to help you to, to start thinking and, and, and help you to work out a project plan for your next wireless rollout, which could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be this week. Your boss calls you in and, hey, we need to go and do this project plan. We need to go and do a wireless network. You're going to learn today what you need to do to execute. So get into the discipline of doing something small, even though this is about enterprise, right? Enterprise, big money, big rollouts. The principles are exactly the same. The disciplines are exactly the same. Get this into your DNA. I know us techies, we just love to do the bits and the bites. I know because I am a techie myself. I used to neglect this project planning side of it, this design. Don't be me. Be better than me. Okay? So, when deploying the wireless LAN, it's important to plan by defining the requirements. What are the requirements? These are the steps. What are the requirements for design, installation, testing, operational support? When you put in a wireless network, it doesn't just live on its own. It doesn't just, you know, it has to be managed. It has to be checked. It has to be improved. It has to be tuned. All of those are wonderful opportunities for you to make revenue, for you to earn mula, right? So take advantage of, of, uh, of these things. The opposite is also true. A poorly designed wireless network is going to give you the worst thing possible, which is a bad reputation. There is nothing worse for an engineer when people talk about you in a negative way. Yeah, no, they're not good. They talk a lot, but when it actually comes to design, now nah, I've always had problems with their networks. Doesn't actually work well. I don't recommend. That's the type of stuff that you don't want. That's the type of stuff that will hurt you as an engineer and will hurt your company as well. Today you're good, tomorrow you're bad. Today you put in one access point, it works. Tomorrow you put in five, it doesn't. Why? Because of this. Uh, because of this. So ideally, you should... Take these steps down, right? Take take these steps down and, and at this point, take the screenshot. This stuff is important. You should be defining the scope, okay? So we, we will talk about this. The project scope. What is this project about? Well, it's about installing a wireless network at such and such a school or such and such a school county or such and such a private school organization. What's the scope? Define it, okay? Develop this WDS, this you know, WBS, this work breakdown structure. Okay, it's a good way of planning the task and tracking the the progress of the uh, of the project. If you don't measure your project, if you don't have goals and and aim to hit these things, how will you ever know if you are being successful? If you're going to hit that project finish on time or not, if there's going to be delays, if there's weaknesses, 
how will you ever know these things if you don't track this okay so if you need to use software to track it do that but these are the high level points develop this work breakdown structure think about staffing okay if you're going to do an installation in a school how much how many people do you need to do this well that depends if the school says to you well you've got six months to do the rollout of five classrooms okay that's good but do schools normally do that no they want it tomorrow they want it yesterday that's what they want so if they want that yesterday well how many people do you need okay have you ever watched those programs on TV? I think they call them extreme makeover, where they, they come into, you know, an area, somebody's home who's, you know, struggling or whatever. And then, you know, in, in a week they build a house. How is that possible? Staffing requirements. If you get your staffing right, you can work in three shifts to eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, 24 hours a day. And in two weeks, you can put up a house, painted, plumbing, electrical. You can do it. It depends on staffing. So staffing requirements, those are important. You need to create a schedule, like I said. Are they going to give you six weeks, six months, six days? These are important. What about budget? These are part of the planning things, right? Pro uh, planning thing. Budget. Well, uh, I want uh, five classrooms. I want wireless in the whole school, but I've actually only got $1,000. Can you do it and start tomorrow and finish by Wednesday? <laughs> You know, <laughs> that that's how that's how sometimes enterprises think. Not not all enterprises, of course. I, I you know I know this, but I've been in this situation before as a small business. Like, yeah, we want network uh, wireless access in the whole thing, and I saw this, you know, these access points in the newspaper advertised for you know for eighty, uh, you know, eighty dollars. So you know, just go ahead and do it. <laughs> what about risks? Are there risks? Evaluate your risk. Another very important part of it. And again, we'll talk about all of these in detail. And then analyze feasibility, the feasibility of this whole project. Right. So now that you've got that screen, this is what we need to consider, right? When you define your requirements, consider requirements and constraints in the following area after you've asked yourself these three questions, right? Only proceed after you know the answers to these. Number one, who or what will use the network and how? Okay, you have to answer that question. Who and what will use the network and how will they use the network? So let's try and quickly get to that. If it's at a school, Who's going to use it? Students. That would be the immediate students. Okay. Does that mean teachers will need the network as well? Does that mean it will only be students? All right. Um, what will they use the network for? Will they just do it to be able to get online homework, to be able to upload their homework? Will they need it to do research? Will they do it just to connect to local resources, for example, to teach uh, computer coding? Who and what will use the network, the wireless network, and how? If you need to, interview people. You know, interview, interview the principal, interview teachers, interview students. What do you expect from the network? Interview the people that have a stake in the success of this. If it's a hospital, well, you need to think about, is this for patients? Are we doing something to give patients communications and access to their families while they're in the hospital? Is that what we're going to do? Or is the wireless network just for devices to connect you know, the, the nurses, the doctors, to give them access to patient information. Interview, find out who and what will use the network and how will they use the network. Very important. So next question, coverage. What's the physical area that's going to receive coverage, right? What is the physical area that's going to receive coverage? Is it a small area? Is it a large area? Are you going to link buildings together? Is there a distance between one building and the, the other? What's, what's the difference? What's the distance between those two buildings? 
Um, is it mobile? Will people be moving from one classroom to the other if it's a school? Will, will you know, how will this, what is the physical area that needs and is going to be covered? That is very important because that's going to have an impact on so many different things. You have to have the answer to that question. Do not proceed until you have crystal clear picture. The next one is capacity. This is the third of these these triangles of these legs that you have to know and that is how much bandwidth is required to support the solution okay if you're just going to be teaching coding and everything is going to be done on the local computer if it's a school for example you have a classroom and there's one classroom with just and all you're going to be doing is teaching people python programming then the chances are that you might not need huge amount of bandwidth. But if you are a school that has a media classroom and you teach augmented reality, you create, you teach 3D, virtual reality, you teach um, a lot of these types of applications where you are pushing the envelope on what can be done with wireless networks and your students need to move around with laptops, with mobile phones, your bandwidth requirements are going to be totally different, okay? So these three are really, really, really important. LOB here stands for line of business. Analyze requirements and fill in gaps. Document requirements. Obtain the requirements from the line of business. What do we mean by that? Well, if you're in a hospital, you're going to have people in radiology that's a line of business you're going to have people in admin that's a line of business you're going to have people in oncology you're going to have people in pharmacy you're going to have people in surgery those are within the hospital those are the lines of business those different maybe you want to call them departments if it's a school it could be you know the faculty of science you know or it could be the media faculty these are the lines of business. These are the people that you need to talk to, to understand. So please, these areas, they will constrain you. They will hold you back if you do not have the answers before you start moving forward. So please screenshot this. I'll give you five seconds. Okay, done. Right. So lots of areas, lots of things to consider and jump into and we're going to do that straight after we have our very first break of the day so let's go to one minute break stretch get out your chair do what you need to do get your circulation moving go get your your uh, your one minute uh, tick on your on your apple watch or your fitbit or whatever it is let's go roll it what can you do in one minute Okay, here we go. I had a good stretch. Okay, so let's um, start this discussion because this is a big topic and this is going to take up a lot of our uh, a lot of our time. Right, when you define requirements, when you define requirements, so this is that first part. Spend time talking with users, with managers, with staff, with teachers, with contractors, okay, from all the lines of business. 
that this wireless LAN is going to serve. In a hospital, staff, department heads, you know, even speak to patients. Speak to people. If you see people in the waiting rooms, speak to them. Ask them, right? The more people you speak to, the more successful the project is going to be, right? Because there's more stakeholders. There's more people that are interested in this thing being a success. If a patient is sitting in the ward and they have access and they can FaceTime their family, they feel happy. They feel good, right? They can communicate with, with, with others. That isolation is not so much there. So they are important stakeholders in, in, in all of this, right? Survey the existing survey the existing wireless network as well what do you have remember we used that statement a wireless a good wireless network needs good wire needs good networking wire so let's go through these um let's go through these topics over here applications let me call up uh right let's go over here oh come on Oh boy. Okay. So I'm trying to show, I don't know if you can see it on screen. I don't think you can. My tablet at the moment is not showing this up. Come on. P there we go. All right. Applications. Applications. What do we mean by applications? What we mean is what are the requirements? Okay. The applications, what are the applications that are going to be used in this project? Is it, is it Office 365? Is it a medical um, software that you have that, that all doctors and nurses and surgeons in the hospital use? What are the applications? Understanding that, very important. Shadow IT. Now, what is shadow IT? Well, this is the unofficial IT, okay? So officially at the school, they put up a wireless network. Unofficially, students might bring in their own access points and connect it, you know, into the network to try and bypass you. They might use hotspots to bypass your network, right? So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about shadow IT. These are things that we need to consider. Define your requirements. Um, are you going to allow people to bring in their own devices uh, and are you going to allow them to hook onto your network, for example, or will you just in a school just provide access for the computers that are in that school? You need to think about these things. What about location, data and analytics? Um, is, is, tracking, is, is tracking devices important to you? Is it important to track where students are or where a laptop is, for example, if it's a student laptop and that laptop goes from the location to location? Is it important for the school to know where that laptop is? If it's a laptop, if it's a school's asset, is it important to track it? Remember, if you're talking about a hospital and a hospital has a lot of very expensive health equipment, as that moves around, that's literally millions of dollars that could be moving around. Is it important to track it? Maybe it is. Maybe you're saying, well, for a hospital, these devices, these class A devices, they are really important. We need to track them. We don't need the others, but this stuff we need. If that's a requirement, then that means when you design your wireless network, you have to think about access points with the ability to do that type of tracking, right? So what about client devices? What type of clients do I expect to support? Do I have a lot of old clients, or old scanners, for example, that only use 802.11.a? For example, do I have a lot of old devices that I have to support? Now, of course, I don't have to support every everyone who walks into my hospital or my school with, with a five-year-old or 10-year-old iPhone, right? Um, that, that hardly even had, you know, 8 to 11a or whatever like that. You can't support all of the students or everyone who walks or all the old devices. But, um, but if you have important devices, like in warehouses, a lot of warehouses still use very old uh, pilot scanners, handheld scanners that used very old technology. 
if the company is not willing to upgrade those, then it means that whatever solution you roll out, you have to consider those devices. So you have to, you can't just say, oh, we're going to put in all five gigahertz uh, AX and we're not going to care about anybody else. No, you have to think about client devices. Signal co coverage areas, right? This is important. Like we said, where are you going to place the stuff? Where are, where, what needs to be covered? What areas need to be covered? Right? Very, very important. Utilization. How is this stuff going to be used? Do you expect it to be very heavy in the morning and less in the afternoon? Right? Ask yourself these questions. What about mobility? Is this stuff going to move around? Are users going to be moving around? What do you expect? Certainly, you would expect doctors and nurses and caring staff, they to be able to have you know, mobile devices or portable devices, grab it, walk to down the corridor, walk down another f a flight of stairs. You would expect these types of devices and mobility to be very high on the list. Maybe in a school, it's different. If you have a fixed classroom, okay, we need to provide access to these computers in the classroom. But for students, they are mobile. They need to get around. So very high, very important. Security. Oh, man. This is such an important one. You need security. Are you going to have guest networks? Are you going to have, you know, how many networks are you going to have? But security, that has to be built from the ground up. What is an impact of a security breach in your organization? So if you're doing a pitch for a hospital, you know, you don't even have to worry about it. You know that security is going to be on the list of requirements that, the, that they're going to need. And they're going to tell you it needs to meet these requirements, these requirements. You got, you're working with patient data. You're working with financial data. So your wireless network needs to secure this data in this way, you know, to meet these particular standards. You know it's going to cost you a lot if you don't. What about scalability? Yes, important. Today, your wireless network is set up for 50 people or 100 people. But what's it going to look like when it needs to grow to 200 or 300 or 500? Do you have the infrastructure place? What are the requirements? Do they say that your network is going to be growing? It is expected to grow. If no one says that in the list of requirements, you ask the question, what is the expected growth? What are we talking about? Today we are designing for here. But if we want this network to run for 18 months or two years, do we need to scale up? Do we need to build in the capacity? Existing infrastructure, we've already mentioned that briefly. Do I already have something or is this a greenfield rollout? Understand in that. Integration, is my wireless network, if I have an existing infrastructure, is it going to plug into that? Is it going to augment the existing structure? Is there an existing wireless network and now you've called us in to just add? Again, another very important. What about the environmental issues? You know, what's the environment that this is going to go into? Um, you know, is it is there a warehouse? Is the environment lots of steel all over the place? Could be if it's a warehouse. What about the school? Well, if it's an old school, like in the UK, you find a lot of these very historical schools. That environment means it's going to be difficult to be going around drilling and putting access points all over the place. Understand your environment. And then, of course, aesthetics. That's really important. Aesthetics. How is this going to be looking? You know, do they want, do they mind seeing an access point on the ceiling? Or they say, no, 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 it's got to be hidden. You know, we don't want to see anything. We don't want it big. We want the smallest that we can have. What are the requirements? Because these are real things that we need to know. So, detailed design. This work breakdown structure that we defined earlier, um, the, 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 the detailed design and the, the design phase starts when we start looking at these things and answering these uh, things. Um, we need these tasks, okay, let's, let's call them tasks. So these are tasks that you need to, uh, to go through when you're thinking about the, getting into the design phase. First of all, a wireless site survey. This is really important. Now, me, I didn't even know that this technology existed when I, you know, when I started doing wireless networks. Now, remember, this is, you know, 14, 15 years ago when I started. It doesn't mean these tools weren't there. They were. I was just not aware that that uh, this was a thing. And I wasn't specialized 
in wireless, it's important to do a site survey. So, so, so important. What does this mean? Well, go to the site. Go take a look at the site. If it's a school, well, you know, you know that taking photographs is going to be a little bit of an issue, right? There's data privacy issues. There's all of those things. So you wait until the school is out and then you arrive at the school and, you know, take photographs of, of where this, this is going to be done, of the different buildings, um, interesting areas, areas where you think there could be problems to do, you know, problems with installation, for example. But the next thing is there are professional tools like Ekahau. Ekahau. If, if, if you don't know about Ekahau, I think it's E-K-A-H-A-U. Those are kind of like everybody in the industry knows. They have professional tools. Now, again, for the small guy, that's not, that's not going to be worthwhile to do. But for the bigger guys, those are professional tools you, you need. And they have a, a, a tool that you will walk around. I think they have a, a, a tool that also can plug into your mobile phone that you walk around and it will tell you the reach of the wireless signal in that particular area. And that way you can start developing a map of, of the areas, right? Of course, it's important. If you've got a map, if you can get a, an architectural overview of everything, that's, that's first prize. If you can do that, absolutely brilliant. But you need to do a wireless site survey. Absolutely have to do something like that. There are tools, um, there are tools, there are software tools that, that you can download. I have a couple on my Mac, but you have them for Windows as well. They're not as professional as, um, as Ekahau, but they will help you to determine if there's a lot of other wireless networks in the area, for example, um, which channels are they using? Um, you know, if everybody is on channel one, then this tool will help you to show you, ah, everybody is on channel one. Maybe I should be on channel six or channel 11 if I'm in the 2.4 uh, range, right? But these are things that you uh, that you that that will come from a wireless site survey. Very important. Consider other technical uh, aspects and constraints. So you need to get access points. You need to get 50 access points into a hospital. Where are you going to put them? Okay. You might say, oh, I'm going to put them on the ceiling. Okay. That makes perfect sense. A lot of these access points are in the ceiling. Every ward is going to have one of these access points. Great. How are you going to get power there? Are you going to, is there, is there a power plug on, on, in each ward? Chances are there isn't. In a classroom, do you have a power plug on the ceiling? You might, because a lot of classrooms use projectors on the ceilings. So if that projector is powered by a power plug, hey, great for you. You might have a, you know, a wireless access point that you can plug in power directly on the ceiling, right? But how are you going to connect that? You can't just have a continual mesh network that's just, you know, feeding off each other. Ideally, all of these access points should have a network cable going into them. Again, a lot of projectors have network cables going into them. So if you already have a network cable going into existing network, well, great. You can just take another network cable and plug it into that access point. If you don't have power up there, then what do you need to do? You need to use power over Ethernet. That brings power over Ethernet into place. What's power over Ethernet? Well, with one cable, with an Ethernet cable, I can also take power to that access point. So I can do two things with one with one cable. I can power the device and I can take network access to it. These are things that will come out as you do your survey and work around. Cabling, do we have to put in cabling or not? Is there existing cabling? Chances are, no, you're going to have to put some of that stuff in anyway, unless you're taking out an older network and putting in a new one and the cabling is all fine. Um, details, remember details. You need details on this, this thing. What are the vendors and the products? What are the vendors and the products? Does the customer, has the customer set it open for you? And we will talk about that a little bit later when we talk about uh, uh, budget, right? But um, uh what vendors are you going to use? Has, did the customer say to you, you have to use these guys? Or did they say, create a proposal? If they say, make a proposal, then say to them, extreme network, absolutely great. you got to get this stuff. We know this product works really well, right? Define your configurations. 
What is the configuration that you want to set this thing up? Are we going to be supporting 2.4? Are we going to be supporting 5? Are we going to be supporting 6? Are we going to be supporting all of them? These things are very important. Verify the design. Once you've put a design, talk to other engineers. You know, go through the contents. If, you've, if, if you are working on this project and you have other engineers around, other designers as well, once you've put this, this design in place, in the design phase, don't go ahead until you've spoken to others, other people with more experience in this, because then those guys will be able to say to you, those people will be able to say to you, that's a great idea, but have you thought about this? What about security cameras? Did you think about those? Oh, yes, I, put, I think about those. Which security cameras are you putting in? Oh, I'm putting those ones that have got, you know, tilt and zoom. And I said, oh, did you know that the POE requirements on those is 90 watts? Like, oh, I didn't. That means... I have to actually change my requirements for the switches that or the POE equipment that's going to power that. It needs to be POE plus or POE plus plus to be able to supply power to those things. Very important. I can't stress this enough. I I used to do this, and this was one of the things I think that gave me a good reputation when I when I worked in South Africa is I didn't enjoy doing this. But I did it because I knew it was important. When you design a network, document it. Document exactly what you're doing. Document why you're thinking like this. You might have said, I'm going to put an access point over here in this corner. And six months later, somebody comes in like, why did the idiot put it over there? You know? If you have a document that says we put it over there because when we did the survey, the site survey, it said to us that even though that's not the best location, because you have this particular machine that can't be moved uh, in the area, that's the best place to put it. Anywhere else is going to give you a weak signal, etc., etc. If you document your stuff, your design, your thinking, why you made those decisions, people will look at that and say, these guys know what they're talking about. They can open it, they can look at it, they can, you know, think about engineers that will come after you. Think about, you know, you, you happily, you've, you've done this document, you've got all this together. Six months down the line, the client wants an upgrade. Now there's, you've been promoted, there's another engineer from the company, he comes in, he doesn't have to spend 20 hours with you asking and you remember, oh, I don't remember why I did this, I think it was. If you document the stuff, Bam, they can go look at it. Oh, we understand exactly what's what's going on over here. Absolutely fantastic. You must document. Very, very important. Obtain design approval. So when you've submitted it to them and they've looked at it, say, cool, we're happy with this. Extreme is is you know is part and parcel of this. We are believing in this. Believe me, when a customer uses extreme networking equipment access points in a stadium like for major league baseball or major or, or football american football and you're going to be providing internet access at the super bowl believe me those designs need to be approved by people with a lot of experience so that they can go over these and say yes this is covered this is covered this is covered really really important for you guys uh, 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 to be done so take a screenshot of this okay Got it? Right. Implementation, implementation phase. Work breakdown structure. Right. So procure implementation phase. You've done your design. Um, you've done your design and now you know customer has give you given you and uh the go ahead for this. So you need to procure the components, right? It's no good designing an entire network and then, you know, they're giving you a, a two week lead to do this whole thing. And it takes three weeks for the, you know, for the order to get to uh, to, to you of the devices of the hardware to get to you. Right. So when you do this type of stuff, procure the components. Right. You need to build that into your design phase. It's going to take us X amount of time to get all of these components, um, uh, to get them here, to get everything here leave a little bit a day or two in case something is missing in case something gets delayed you know in times like now with COVID, even more so right give a little bit more margin for the stuff 
One of the things that's also very, very important is what we call sparing. You have to build in a decent amount of sparing. If your project plan calls for, say, 100 APs, right? You're going to have 50 wards. You're going to have this, this. You're going to have offices. You're going to have the APs in different locations. If your project plan calls for 50 actual APs, Build in a margin of sparing, a margin of spares that you're going to keep on site. OK, customers going to pay for them, but building that into your solution because things go wrong. Devices die. Things happen. And if you have an oncology department or radiology department and an access point goes down, that's really critical. So. Make sure that in your project plan, you've got an adequate level of um, space in place so that when you start implementing this, there's a there's a location where these devices are stored, maybe in IT, you know, they are labeled. So maybe you have different access points, different types of access points. Maybe you need to keep two or three spares of each of them right? Because maybe the reason you chose this access point in the ward was, well, you know, if it's a ward private patient, you don't need device tracking, you don't need those. So it's a different type of access point. But the for the devices that, that are really expensive, you want to have device tracking on them, a different type of access point. So make sure you keep an adequate amount of spares to cover this eventuality if something fails. Think about warranties, right? If a company offers you a warranty, say a three year next business day on site warranty, it's going to cost you some money. But if you have spares, they obviously are going to help you immediately there because there's this buffer that you can call from. But if a company, if you have to make the choice between two product offerings and one is one year and one is three years, then what's the differentiation in price? Maybe it will be better to get a three-year warranty. Think about these things. What about support agreements? Okay, you can't have many and, and lots of buffer stock, but you can see how if you have buffer stock available for you, that it makes these things, these decisions a lot easier for you, right? Is there maintenance support agreements? If you're with extreme networks, is there a maintenance agreement? Is there a support agreement with the people that are installing this, doing the rollout or, or out of all of this? Are there support agreements with them? Think about that. Um, don't take the screenshot yet because there's more stuff coming on here, but it's time for our 10 minute break. See you in 10 minutes.
what a wonderful opportunity I had to um, come to Chelmsford. Um, if you think about wireless, you can't think about that without thinking about radio. It's all about radio. And who other than Guglielmo Marconi? I mean, that name is famous around the world. An Italian inventor, um, born in Bologna, Italy, April 25th, 1874. Uh, he was the son of Giuseppe Marconi and an Irish lass by the name of Annie Jameson. He didn't have a university education, but he did have a private education uh, in Bologna, Florence and in Leghorn as well. Uh, he took really keen interest in physics um, and electrical science and studied the works of Maxwell and Hertz, for example. In 1895, he became experimenting with laboratory. And yeah, you can see there's the plaque, the blue plaque of famous people that they place on buildings within the UK. So um, in 19, 1895, he began laboratory experiments at his uh, father's estate in Ponticcio where he succeeded in sending wireless signals, listen to this, over a distance of one and a half miles. I saw this plaque, I came to the factory in Chelmsford, the New Street factory, and, um, and it, was, it was in this factory um, that was built in 1912. The, this was actually the very first purpose-built radio factory in the world. You'll see those two big antennas um, over there. Um, at one stage, this factory used to employ about 6,000 people from uh, in Chalford, which is really, really amazing when you come here and see this, uh, see this place. It was bombed in uh, May 1941, with about 17 people died. One of the really amazing things about this factory was that in 1920, in 1922, years before the BBC was established, this factory made history as the first official British sound broadcast, uh, uh, including the famous concert by Dame Nellie Melba. I mean, that's two years before the first um, uh, before the BBC was formed. Really, really quite incredible. The other thing about uh, Marconi. He was one of the very youngest ever to receive a Nobel Prize. He got a Nobel Prize for physics. Uh, I think it was when he was 36 years old um, in 1909. Him and Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand Braun. So an incredible person, an incredible inventor, an incredible Italian that I guess, ultimately, we could say has led to all of our employment to be being here and teaching this content all due to this man. Thank you, sir. We give you a lot of honor for what you did and for your curiosity. Fantastic. And this is just me driving on the way back to Cambridge from Chelmsford, a little bit of the British countryside. For those of you who don't like driving on the left. Yeah, I know. It's weird. And then also for the, uh, the, the roundabouts that someone spoke about last week that, uh, that are absolutely frightening. Yes, we can see how they could be frightening. Cheers.
Welcome back, part two. I know this is a, a lot of stuff, right? Uh, a lot of stuff to get through, but this is really important. This is really important stuff. So I hope you're making lots and lots of notes. Okay, next point we're gonna go to here is licensing or subscriptions. Now, many vendors have solutions in wireless where they have controllers. Uh, where they have physical controllers that control uh, access points, okay? And Extreme has those. Is there subscriptions? If there are, what are the subscriptions? We certainly at Extreme, you know that we have these controller models, which are physical controllers, but we also have a solution called Extreme Cloud IQ where the controller is moved into the cloud, right? Um, and it's cloud agnostic. So you could be using, for example, the Amazon cloud, or if there's special requirements, you could use Azure or the Google cloud, for example. But those services have subscriptions um, and, and licensing. Now, anybody who has dealt with our competitors and with us in the past knows that one of the things that, that IT people really <laughs> detest is licensing agreements and most of the reason is they are so complicated when i was in south africa and i ran the business microsoft i don't know if they still have it but they used to have a specialization <clears throat> that was just about licensing <coughs> you could actually go and do a course that was just about licensing right imagine having one person in your company having to spend a day or two to go out and do training just so that you can get your licensing right. 
so that you're not in breach of any licensing requirements, right? It was crazy and it was like so much paperwork and it was complicated to do. In extreme, one of the things that we've done is we've looked at this and we've said, you know what? This is a pain for IT people. This is a pain area. You buy an access point, a lot of our vendors, uh, of our competitors, you buy an access point and it's a basic access point. If you want this feature, then there's another license for that. If you want to track, oh, no, there's another license for that. If you want this, oh, no, no, that's another license. And you end up with one product having six different licenses to use the functionality of that product. We did a good look at that and we said, you know what? This is a waste of time. This is a waste of energy. This is just a waste. Let's make it really simple. So you buy a device, you license a, you know, a device, you can move that device, you can replace that device with another one and the license, you know, applies to that device. One year, two year, three year, you know, it's so simple to do, you know, serial number, put it in, boom, there you have it. All the functionality, everything, everything that's on that AP, boom, that license gives you access to all of that. It's like, it saves you a huge amount of time. But if you decide not to go with Extreme and to go with one of the other gray ones, good luck. <laughs> I know, I, I feel your pain, but you don't have to have pain. So subscriptions or licensing is really important, okay? Very, very important. You need to think about those things. Implementation phase, lead time, I've already spoken about that. How long is it going to take before the uh, the, the equipment uh, all arrives? Do you need, is there any, um, uh, you know, um, software that needs to be developed? You know, this, this of course, should have already been thought about, uh, you know, uh, pre uh, previously, right? All right, let's go to here and oops, right. I'll just call these up, bring them on and okay, there we go. These are the other ones. Um, configuration, right? When you start implementing, there's going to be time that you need to add, uh, uh, put aside for configuring components. One of the beautiful things about Extreme Cloud IQ, let's say you have 30 or 40 access points in Extreme Cloud IQ, as that being the controller. And, and let's just say that they are all the same type of access points. Then the beauty of this whole thing is you do the configuration in the cloud, in, in Extreme Cloud IQ of that access point. Say this access point, I want the um, 2.4 radio, uh, you know, gigahertz band to be on radio one, and I want the five gigabit band to be on radio two. That's how I want it to work. Um, and I want the, you know, the, the location services to be turned off. You can go into Cloud IQ, say this is the template that I want you, or the profile that I want you to apply to this access point. That's it. When a now when you when you um when you onboard your devices, right? Now you're ready to onboard, you've taken all your serial numbers that we sent you, you go to Cloud IQ, say, all right, onboard all of these devices, you put in the serial numbers just by importing a file, boom, all of them are now connected uh, or licensed within Cloud IQ. Now you just go into your network and you plug them in. You just plug them in, plug them in, plug them in, plug them in. And you plug them in, they connect. Uh, to to cloud using CapWap uh, protocol, and they go to CapWap, CapWap ident or, or uh, XIQ identifies them, says, oh, okay, I know this serial number, this belongs to this particular school or this particular hospital. Let me go look at the profile that the administrator has already created for this. And it pushes that profile down to these devices, right? Does the configuration for you automatically. Um, Install a pilot system. This is quite important. If you've got a big rollout, you might want to do this first, right? Enterprise for sure. You build a, they call this building a lab. So you do a, you do a lab, do the configuration, put one or two access points in your lab, test the configuration, push it out. Does it do what it's supposed to do, right? So before you go live with everything, go do one of these. 
install the company-wide system of course perform verification testing is it testing the way that I that I wanted to do when I implement this does this access point provide this coverage in this area I put it over here my design told me that if I place it here this is the signal that I'm going to get in the area verify it is it working is it doing that document the implementation so previously we said you know just go in and um, uh, and do the um, uh, the, the documentation for the project plan now that it's working go in and do that okay oops I didn't ask you to take the screenshot if you go in now you can go and take that screenshot sorry I have to look over over my phone okay next one the operations and maintenance phase so you've implemented this it's now up and running it doesn't mean you walk away and you never come back to that, right? Every IT person knows that even though we're dealing with bits and bytes, everybody knows that occasionally you have to reboot your computer, right? <laughs> it's just, you have to control, alt, delete, reboot your computer. You have to do it. No, no issue about that. You have to do it. Devices also occasionally need to to be rebooted but you need to do maintenance operational maintenance on the, on these things so what is going to be the support procedures what is it what is it that you're going to need to do to support this operation right are you going to need to um to have a team on site is it so large that you're going to have to have an it person on site to be able to help you with this are we talking about a situation where for example um uh the, the hospital might have their own small it team um and they're gonna call on you so for they're gonna do maintenance for certain certain types of stuff or will they call you if if you're a company Will they call you for everything? Do you have a help desk for them to, to phone? So define what are the procedures, support procedures. Sometimes people will say, well, let's define it in, in, a, in a document. And they'll say, okay, if it's about connectivity issues, if a user can't connect, if they say they got slow access, if they do this, then this is who you call. Call your help desk for this. Now, if those things don't work, then you escalate. Then you escalate to, to us. We are the support company. If the IT person on site at the hospital, at the school can't help, then you go to the next level, escalation procedure. And if that doesn't work, you go to the third level of escalation procedure. So it's important that you document this and that the people who are going to use the system, for example, the teachers, um, uh, the IT people at the school, uh, at, at the enterprise, it's important that they are familiar with these procedures, right? Not to avoid responsibilities, but to to have a set way that these things get resolved. Some things are going to be defined, some of these policies are going to be defined on, on mission critical, right? If you have a machine in radiology, and that machine is not able to connect to the network wirelessly because there's some or other issue, this connectivity, that has got to be, you know, on the list of priorities, that has to be done like right now, right? Other stuff can be like, oh, you know what? We've got a problem with this access point. It's telling us that it's overheating, but we've got other access points in the area to cover that. So we'll get to that. We'll order a new part for that and it will be here tomorrow. It's okay. No one is being negatively impacted by something like that. So those are some of the things that you're going to define. This, of course, goes hand in, in hand with what I've just said before. How do you help support staff so if if you've implemented this wonderful wireless network and the school has one it person help them to help you by empowering them teaching them how to get onto cloud iq show them how to do stuff this is how you know if an access point goes faulty this is how you replace it with one of those spares this is what you do just go here take it out put this one in, wait for that light to turn white or yellow or green or whatever it is, then you're going to see it. This is it. It's all you need to do. That That's helping people to empower themselves and help their organization. Very, very important. Train them, of course. Train them to do what they need to do. 
and transfer the network to operations and maintenance. So once this whole thing has been uh, uh, has been set up, train your users on what they need to do. Right. We've gone through that. Next one. Oh, I should have said, go back, take a screenshot of that. Right. Next one. Very important to identify staffing. If you're going to do a deployment of a wireless network, then staffing is very important. All right. So how do you go about staffing? How do you gonna go about doing something like this? Well, the project manager is probably the most uh, important person once you've identified, you know, in, in the in the WBS, right? Um, you're going to the project manager is going to be the person that has to pull all of these things to together. Now, this would generally be a uh, an outside person, not all the time, okay? But generally be the company that's going to do the work. If you are that company, if you are part of that company, then it, there's a good chance there's somebody within your organization that's a project manager. They might not be the person who designed the wireless network. They might be a specialist in this. They do project planning. It, it could be. When I ran my own business, unfortunately, I was a really small business. And, and if that's you, then you know that you become the jack of all trades, right? You're the guy who does the network design, the network planning. You do the staffing. You do the training. You do the invoicing, the marketing. You do all of those. You do absolutely all of those things. It's very common, especially in countries like South Africa. You know, you have to be you know, knowledgeable at a lot of things. But when I came to the UK, one of the things I found so interesting, and, and this is the same thing in America, is that there's so much business. The, the, the markets are so big that large companies, they have specialists in each of these areas. So you design a wireless network and a project manager will then work together with you to oversee how you build this particular uh, plan. But um, user representatives. So if you're going to put a whole project plan together and you want it to be to work really well, have a user representative. It could be an IT person from that organization, um, uh, from a hospital, <clears throat> from your customer school, for example. It could be maybe a teacher, maybe a principal, maybe a senior manager at the school, right? They might tell you information that you wouldn't know just from a project plan. You might say, okay, we're going to do six weeks. We're going to start here. We're going to go here. This is what you're going to do. And somebody who's on that, on that project management team, a representative from that school would say, no, 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 you can't because we, we are having a shutdown at the school because of this. And, uh, you know, we're having a, a whole rewiring of the electrical system at the school, et cetera, et cetera. They'd be able to give you information that you wouldn't be able to get any other way. You might want to, if the organization is large enough, have analysts, right, who, who look at this you'd have to be pretty big to have analysts uh, to be able to do this, right? Engineers, are you going to have wireless engineers? This would always be a good plan. Have an engineer, um, you know, on site, for example, when you're doing a deployment to make sure that everything is okay, to, you know, to be aware, to be on call. If there's a problem, bring out an engineer, let him take a look at a specialist in this. People to implement this. Your organization might have techies, um, people who are generally newer to the organization. And so once the design has been done, the project plan has been done, etc., etc., you might have these implementers who will come in. It might even be a third party company. You do all of this work and then you sub farm. For example, I saw this a lot in South Africa. We had network companies that specialized in cabling. So I did a you know, network for a couple of schools, but I, if it was a small office, I could do the network cabling. But a school, no, I just don't have the time or, or the ability to do this or the staffing. So I would subcontract a network company to come in, a wiring company to do all of this for me. So if this is a situation for you, the implementers in this case might not just be junior staff that you might have, but actually might be companies that you might subcontract to do some of this uh, implementation for you. You'd also have operations and maintenance representatives. So again, part of the uh, part of the 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 IT people, for example, um, who are going to be operating this on a day to day basis. These are stakeholders. These are people that 
the the success of your project plan, the success of your project is going to be very dependent on these people. And so identify them early up front. Can you help me with this? We're going to need two people from the school, from the hospital to attend meetings on Zoom or in person. We're going to need your input about all of these things. Think about this stuff. All right, take a screenshot. We're going to go to the next section. Right. Right. What about a schedule, right? You might overlook this. You've got the design plan. You've got all of these things, but all of this has to go around the schedule. If it's a school, you need to know we're going to have windows of opportunity. Either you work, well, if it, if you were building a wireless network during the start of COVID when they shut down the schools, this would have been a good window of opportunity, right? But generally speaking, you never have a fantastic window of opportunity if the enterprise is ongoing. If it's greenfield, a new development, a new building, it's easier over there. Not, not. I'm not saying it's dead easy, but I'm saying it's it's easier. But schedules, all right? If it's a school, chances are you can't work during school hours. It's as easy as that. And again, this brings me to, to limits. You're probably going to have to make sure if, if you're going to be on site during school hours that your staff, certainly in the UK and the US, that, you know, that they've been vetted by the school and by the, you know, security or police or whatever, that they don't have a criminal record, you know, with 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 kids and things like that. Right. So these these are things you might think, but that's but that's important. You need to know about these things. Very important. So you're probably not going to be able to work during school hours. So you're going to have to consider, okay, so maybe we have to start, if you're in the UK, say from half past three onwards, and we're going to work, say, till three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, till 10 o'clock at night. You need availability at the school from half past three till, till 10 o'clock. So our staff are going to have to go on extended shifts or during this period of implementation. We need to make sure that our staff can work during those particular hours, right? Um um, so the schedules are important. In hospitals, you don't. <laughs> it's difficult, right? You're going to put the wireless access point. You've got patients in the rooms. The windows of opportunity become a lot more complex. A stadium, well, a stadium is going to be easier, right? Because a stadium is not used every day, Monday to, to Saturday or to Sunday. In the off-season, you can build these. But even then, it means that there's a window of opportunity that you can use to roll out these particular things. The MLB season has started. Yeah, it's 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 started. You should have already done a wireless deployment pre the season starting if this is what you wanted to do. So starting dates, um, starting dates, really important. Duration, due date of each task. As a project manager, you're going to create phases for this. You're going to create phase one you know, uh, uh, on-site survey, uh, phase two, second on-site survey, phase three, phase four, phase five. A project plan is going to have through these phases and you're going to be working through these phases to set deadlines, right? So as you go through, okay, we met this deadline, we met this gate, this is correct. Oh, this now has affected everything else. If something, if you see something that's going to affect a project plan, for example, like COVID, your implementation had been, okay, well, we're going to do this in six weeks. Now, because of COVID, wow, there's a problem. It's going to, this delay is going to affect everything else because it means we can't go on site for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. COVID is an unusual situation, but it's not the only uh, situation that, that is unusual. There's lots of these things that creep up you know, all times. So starting date, duration. Ah, there's a typo. Starting. It says steering date. Starting date. Claire, make a note of that, please. Relationships between phases and task. What's a phase? What's what's a task? If you haven't heard of it, there's um there's something called the Gantt chart, G-A-N-T-T, -T, a Gantt chart. If you've ever used a tool like Microsoft Project, 
it's not the only one. There's many different uh, project management tools. It creates a chart that you can see tasks listed in a time order, right? Here is the start. It's going to go for two weeks. Then the task is finished. Then underneath that is the next task that happens. That next task could happen concurrently with the one above it or slightly into it. You you know, you, you get the idea. It, it, um, uh, it's a visual representation of a chart of a of a phased approach to um to the to the project plan to a schedule right let's go there and take a screenshot five seconds to take a screenshot right and now that you've taken a screenshot we have the second one minute break stretch time come on get up out your chair go for a stretch one minute see you back in a minute Welcome back. The things, the things that we do. Uh, uh, the things we do for love. For Academy. Okay, I hope you had a good, uh, I hope you had a good, uh, a good stretch. You know, we're always looking for ways to be inventive on Academy, to do things differently, right? And I, I really hope you enjoy this as much as uh, as much as 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 we do because <laughs> we have a lot of fun when we have these meetings during the week and 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 think up you know what we're going to do this week uh, you know what uh, what what are going what are we going to record you know it's uh, it's funny <laughs> I love it we love laughing we love that you laugh with us as well okay so this is where we were uh, last time. And Clay will make sure that it doesn't say steering uh, date, but starting date. Okay, so let's move on to the mula. Let's move on to the uh, to the dosh, like they say. Okay, so budget. How do you develop? Uh, how do you develop a budget for something like this? Okay, budget is is kind of it tech is. We, we like to keep away from, from these things of budgets. It's like we like to say, no, this is just, you know, I'm, I'm a techie. Oops, threw my pen away. I'm a techie. I don't work with this stuff. This is for other people. But have you ever noticed how few IT people sit on boards of companies? It's normally marketing, sales, engineering, uh, um, if engineering gets on, uh, you know, managers, executives. And for some reason, technical people don't always sit on this board. Now, having said that, today, it's much better than what it was 15, 20 years ago, right? Uh, you know, IT people never made it onto, onto, onto the board. Everybody else decided what to do and then made the IT guy do that. Nowadays, the role of, of IT director, of CTO, those those roles are board level roles, especially in companies with vision. Certainly at at extreme, those those roles are very important roles. And at technical companies, you would imagine that that's bread and butter. But there's probably a lot of companies, non technical companies, that still think that the IT division, the IT people, are like you know, oh, it's the IT guys. You know, they don't see them as strategic to their business. Hopefully. COVID kind of changed that and you started to see how important these things were. But one of the reasons I think as well 
that IT people are not as common in boards of companies as what they should be, especially non-technical uh, companies, non-IT companies, is because of the very poor skills when it comes to things like management and leadership and, and, and finance, for example. Talk to the IT guy about bits and bytes, and they are brilliant. Talk to them about anything else, and they are useless, especially for finance. Now, if you're in IT and you love IT, then IT should always be your, your first love, right? It's always about IT. That is your first. If you're good at it, then stay good at that. But if you want to make yourself a lot more valuable as a person, as an asset to your company, acquire management skills, understand the language, just like I'm trying to help you, even maybe non-IT people, to understand the language, the terminology that we use in networking, do the same thing when it comes to management understand what they mean when they talk about return on investment understand what that means to an accountant and if you don't go to the accountant and say to him i'm in it i heard you talk about this i don't understand that how does that relate to what we do what do we need to think about build relationships with the finance people that will help you no end i know you might think oh all finance people are boring it's it they're not all boring if you just take the time to speak to them the same as legal people hate lawyers right lawyers ah, ah. build relationships with lawyers so that you understand about the law as it relates to the job that you do you know you think, ah, oh, my job, my job's in IT. I've got nothing to do with law. What have I got to do with law? What about data protection? You consider that? Data protection is all about law. It's how you manage data, how you store data, how you back up data, right? You don't work as an IT person, you don't work in isolation. You work in a team. You are not an island. And if I can give you any encouragement and any tip as a IT person, learn about finance. You know, if your company has a little course that they do on company finance, take that, pass it. If you fail, take it again and again. Speak to the accounting people. Ask them to explain how budget works in a company. Ask them how they think about budget for IT. They will explain these things to you. And if you understand this, if you understand the language, the terminology of finance, it would make your worth at a company so much more. It broadens your scope. I can now talk about finance in IT. I can talk about recruitment in IT. I can talk about legal in IT because I've had these conversations with these different departments. So if you want to be a successful person, if you're attending academy because you want to be successful, then get skills in these auxiliary, auxiliary ancillary uh, roles that are might not directly related to bits and bytes but affect you. Remember, as an IT person, you are not an island. You work as part of a team. Okay? Get those skills. They will help you. Right. So, I like to teach these things. And it's not because, you know, of anything else other than I look at my own experience and I see my own weaknesses when I ran a business. And if I had known this stuff, I would have been a lot more successful. You can too. Right. So what applications will the wireless LAN support? Why do we put this under developing a budget? Because is there anything further that we need? Is there anything further that these applications are going to need um, when we install this wireless networking? Is there anything we need to think about? Okay. Is there, will there be an impact 
on application cost once we roll out the wireless network? What about how many client devices will the will the wireless LAN serve directly? We've kind of already spoken uh, about this, but will this have a but will this have an impact? On our network on costs when it comes to budget so if i increase if i have for example i've put in a wireless network i've put in excess capacity and my staffing was 50 now my staffing goes to 75 uh, 75 people another 25 people coming into the office so my staffing levels have gone up by say 50 50 percent will this have an impact on budget for this wireless deployment is the capacity that i've built into the network is it enough to be ha to be able to handle that growth have i built in margin right the good news is if you've done your work properly then you've spoken to the stakeholders you would have spoken to the finance people you would have spoken to hr and they would have said to you Oh, we're going to have a growth. We're planning on hiring. We're going to be expanding. You would have done that. You would have thought about that before you started the deployment and you would have built that into the solution. Developing a budget. Um, if you are supporting IoT devices, is this an IT or an OT um, budget issue? So if there are IoT devices, if there are sensors, if there are all of these things coming into your network, is is this coming out of the wireless budget or is this coming out of you know other budget you need to be aware of this how many access point <laughs> claire we got another typo over here <laughs> actually this is not a bad typo <laughs> how many pints are needed well to do a budget lot <laughs> lots of pints <laughs> um that's supposed to be access points. Do you need to install new cabling and switches? Okay, you need to to think about that. Do we need do we need to install new access points and switches? If you do, you need to budget that. You need to put it into the whole budget. This is how you develop a a budget. These are the types of questions. Do you need to develop any new application software? Probably not. If you go with the Extreme Cloud IQ, well. All of this component as extreme that maintenance fee that you pay that license fee that you pay for a, a year license or a three year license guess what all the updates that come in cloud iq all of those are part and parcel of that so you wake up one morning you log into xiq and it says oh there's a new update that's been done these are the new features great stuff for you guess what zero cost to you it's already been paid for in your subscription good stuff what services will be outsourced are you going to use managed services? Is this going to be a, a part of the cost? And so finance departments will often look at this. They will say, okay, so what's the operational cost to do an installation of a wireless network? They know that they're going to have to pay that once up front. And then operational departments or IT department or finance departments, I should say finance departments, knows that there's an, always going to be an operational cost. So what's the operational cost? That's all part of the budget. So this is the upfront cost. This is what it's going to cost to roll out the network from the design phase, implementation phase, all of these different phases to completion. Once it's completed, we sign off. We within budget, hopefully. And now we go into a maintenance phase and we're going to pay this company to maintain a system, to look after XIQ for us, you know, to be aware when anything changes or needs to be done. They will. This is all part of the deployment phase oh screenshot sorry <laughs> take your screenshot okay risk risk very very important when you plan a wireless network you need to be sure to carefully assess and do everything you can to mitigate to reduce risks okay Anybody who says to you that there aren't any risks, that the risks are minimal, are lying to you. That's not the case. <laughs> there will always be risk. It's good to have someone on the project team who has experience in this. That project team could be you, part of the team that you work, or it could be somebody who works in that company, right? That we've said is going to be part of this, this team that's going to go through and help you develop your project plan. So 
evaluate the risk. What is the risk? Is the are we going to use contractors? Okay, what is the risk? Is the risk high or is the risk low? No, we've had been with this company a long time. They have lots of staffing. You know, if it's a one man company, well, the risk becomes higher. You might. I, I was a one man company at the stage. Uh, then I ha hired other people. But when I was a one man company, I was a risk. It depends on the industry. I would never have taken on the role of doing the IT at a hospital and a hospital would never have given that to a company with one person. You know, it's just you can't do that. You would need to be a full time because if a machine goes down because of a wireless access point, because of an access point, that's too much of a risk. We can't wait two or three or four hours for you to get here. So risks are very important. What about, you know, people leave. People leave companies and they move to other companies, right? Uh, we do a sad face. Mm, they left. Uh, they're crying over here. They've left. Um, someone is, is that a risk? You know, it's something that you need to think about. What about the level of management commitment and ownership? This is an important thing. For any project to be successful, it can't be driven from the bottom up, right? Maybe the idea comes from the IT department, and that doesn't mean that they are the bottom, right? It doesn't mean that. But if an idea comes and from the from from the IT department, look, we really need a wireless network in the school, and these are the reasons why you come up with a project plan, you come out with a with a scope. This is what we need to do. The authorization and the permission <clears throat> and the guarantee for your project to go well is if you get the buy-in of the people at the top. If the people at the top are not supporting you with finance and, and, and with encouragement and everything that you need with oversight and the governance, you're going to struggle. Don't take on projects without the support of your seniors, without the support of management, without the blessing from the top. Because the time is going to come where you're going to need the support, you're going to need their finance. And if you don't have their blessing, they will pull the rug out from under you and you will fail. And you will fail because it was your fault. Because you think you thought that you could do stuff like this on your own. This is a risk. If you try and do projects on your own without the involvement of management, without the blessing of management, this project will have a very high risk of failure. And if it fails, if it fails, you are the one that it's going to come down to because you didn't get the blessing, you didn't get the buy-in from management above you. So make sure that you do this. It's part of your risk analysis when you look at this, okay? Also look at relevant uh, relevant technologies. Obviously, right? We said, uh, you know, we, we said this, I think, in the last session, um, in the last uh, lecture that we had, I think, where we spoke about... Um, uh, we were talking about different technologies. 802.11ax, if you buy an equipment today, then don't suffer the risk of being redundant tomorrow. Like, no, 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 we can get this stuff really cheaper, you know, because we don't have to buy the AX, we can buy the AC or, or we can buy previous stuff because it's really cheaper. It might be cheaper, but you run the risk of not being able to expand your network, of not being able to to uh, to take on any new devices, all the new technologies, because you can't use them on on this. The risk, you know, the technology is is important. We're not talking about. We know that as you buy new technology, there's always new stuff coming out. We we know that this is not about that. But look at think and consider the risk if you decide to buy older technology because it's cheaper right think about those things on the other hand also be careful about buying technology that hasn't been accredited yet so you know we're talking about people developing the next standard over uh, after 802.11 ax and people might come out and say oh we've got the next standard implemented already if it's not officially ratified, if it if that is not an official standard, then you're running a big risk that that feature and that hardware is not going to be supported. So think about risk. You almost have to become, you know, it has to be part and parcel of your design thinking. Risk, 
okay things that can go wrong is there a risk about connecting into legacy systems so a lot of older devices especially in in hospitals now i don't mean you know devices that are 20 years old or so but some devices in hospitals for example they don't have wireless you know radiology department you know uh one of these big machines that does x-rays and things like that they might not have wireless technology built into them they might not but you might they might have ethernet though you might be able to have a bridge right that goes from ethernet into a wireless device right into a wireless access point and provide wireless to that device even though it might not have there might be ways that that you can do this you could possibly use a a mesh network you know if these devices don't have never had network connectivity if they've got the port well you might plug them into a mesh uh, access point and then provide access through so are there risks when you do something like this of, of legacy uh, devices? Remember, if you have a lot of legacy devices, they are going to slow down your network. They will. So you need to consider these. These might be risks to the successful implementation of your business and of this project. Do you have these service level agreements, SLAs? Now, you might decide, oh, no, a service level agreement is really expensive. Um, I don't want to do that. Service level agreement, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everybody knows, but let me just address those people who might not know. It just means you sign an agreement with a company that's going to do the maintenance of the system or the operations of the system. And you basically say to them, this service level agreement means I'm paying you X amount of dollars or X amount of pounds or X amount of euros per month. And for that, if I call, you must have somebody on site. If it's escalation level one, you must have somebody on site within one hour, right? Or within six hours. The problem must be solved within six hours. This is a service level agreement. They cost money. They do. But if you don't have them, if you don't have them, what's the cost of not having them? That's a more important cost. Not how much they cost, but what do they cost when you don't have them in place? Right. Screenshot, please. Take the screenshot. Take the screenshot of that. Right. Let's move on to the next area. Analyzing feasibility, right? Um, analyzing feasibility, feasibility studies. A study, it's a study that helps a business decide whether to proceed with the project based on the costs associated with the components, expected benefits, and deploying the system. Generally speaking, before companies allocate money to a project, so before the finance director allocates half a million dollars to your wireless LAN uh, upgrade, they're going to want to see a feasibility study. This needs to come out of your, you know, the original project plan, probably even before the product plan or, or out of the project plan, a feasibility study. And this says, well, it's going to cost us X amount to do this implementation. The benefits, however, are the following. So we could do things like, it's going to cost us half a million to put a wireless network into our hospitals. But it's going to mean that if somebody asks what are the inventory levels on this particular medication, we can now get it in five seconds rather than somebody having to go down to the stock room to go and check or phoning somebody and that person going to the shelves and going to count or doing all of this information. Now, yes, you can get it on the computer, yes, but now it doesn't matter where our doctors or nurses or technicians are anywhere in the hospital, they can get this information like that. What is the cost benefit to having that over, you know, 500 staff members if each one of them does that three times a day? How much time do you save? If you look at that over three years, is it more than 500,000? Is it less than 500? What is the benefit of that? What is the benefit of equipment of us knowing where the equipment is so if you have these portable monitors that hospitals use a lot what is the benefit of tracking that in real time so if 
the doctor needs one here right now, they can go to the device and say, where's the closest one? And says, the closest one is here in the ward next door. Instead of going around asking people, can you get me one? Does anybody know? Work that out over a period of time and look at the cost benefits. How much is this going to save you? How much money is that going to save you? Look at the impact on your users. Look at the impact on existing systems. A feasibility study at the end of the day should tell the people in finance that, you know what, this is an investment that is worth making because although the cost is $500,000 that we have to invest in this wireless network, over a period of three years, we recoup the cost 10 times just because of the ability for us to move and, you know, having this as a competitive edge. Take a screenshot um, on, on this one. Let's move to the next topic. Questions to consider. So here's another thing that I didn't do a lot of. And today I look back and I say, oh, man, if I had done this, this would have helped me so much. And that is once the project has been completed, what were the lessons that I learned on this project? OK, now, why is this important? Because if you learn the lessons on this project, then you can take those lessons and apply it to all things. The next project that you do and the next one and the next one. Think about the way that we've handled um, that governments have handled COVID around the world. I think. You know, if we go in, in years to come, when we study and analyze what's actually happened, I think that there will be many governments that will learn from these lessons and say, we made a mistake here. We didn't close early enough. We didn't do this. We didn't do that. We didn't do this. We should have done this. But this we did really well and that we did really well. But this we did really badly. And so when you finish a project by going back by going back to the project, there's a whole lot of questions that you can ask and the answers are going to help you as an engineer, help you as a project planner, help you as a network designer to get better at what you do, to improve the level of what you do so that you go to the next level. OK, so some of the questions that you're going to ask are, does the implemented system perform as the project team and user expected it to? Now, you cannot do this the day after you sign off on that project being completed. OK, so this is more of a medium to long term. So you come back three months after when you finished your plan. Does it do what it says on the tin? We said that it would help people mobility. We said it would make our patients happier because they can now FaceTime their family. We said that we could track our equipment better. Have we seen that? Has less equipment gone missing? Have we seen the benefits of these things? Right. Very important. The next one. Did management. Oops. So let's do that. Did management continue to support the project till the end, all right? Did management support the project all the way through? These are important lessons. Why? If they didn't, what was it that stopped them supporting this? Did we say the cost would be $500,000 and within three weeks we'd gone back to them and said it's going to be six hundred, and then seven hundred, and then eight hundred? right? You can see why they would have pulled this out. And if that happened, it means that we did something wrong. When we did the planning, when we did the detailed views, we did something wrong. There was something there that we didn't look at properly. So we have to improve on our side. What about how can communication be improved? Was there anything that could be improved in terms of communication between the team members? Did did we always communicate openly? Did we always communicate honestly? These are really important questions. Were there any problems associated with the mechanics of, of product procurement? I've seen this happen where 
a company said, um, you know, we're going to be importing, you know, this stuff. Just um, sorry, it was in my previous company. We were going to sell some equipment to a particular, you know, company, um, and they happened to be in one of these countries where suddenly the UK had said you're not allowed to export that type of equipment. So you had built a whole project plan, and suddenly you hit a wobbly. And like, how are we going to do this? Procurement. You thought that you could deliver in four weeks. Guess what? This pro this this stuff. Uh, there was a the, there was a problem with procurement. It took six weeks or eight weeks. So, what does this mean for us? Does this mean that this is going to happen every time? Was that supplier? Was this a once off, or is this common? Do we always have this? And the result of that would could mean that you're going to go for somebody else, go for another company, another procurement uh, supplier, somebody else who, who provides content, maybe somebody closer to you. Yes, that's why these things are so important. Was this is probably the most on this this is probably the most important of all of them. Was the project delivered within budget? The finance people, you will be very friendly with finance people. If you have a project and it gets delivered on budget and on time or under budget and on time, if the finance people budgeted half a million and you came in at 450,000, you've done really well. If you come in at 550,000, Poor planning. That's what they're going to say about you. Poor planning. They didn't think this through. I mean, unless they were, you know, COVID and, and things like that, that were no one could have foreseen that. But generally speaking, this is very important. And if the answer to this is no, then it means you and the people that worked on this project need to go back and look at what was it that you did incorrectly? What was it? What did you fluff? What were the things that you got so wrong that caused this project to go over budget and over time. Screenshot. We're getting close to the end now on this. I know it's been a lot of talking, a lot of uh, different stuff that we've been going through, but this is important for us to get this right. So this quickly is now slight. This, this now becomes lighter, right? Um, um, it's not so much heavy design work but today's wi-fi technology specifically wi-fi 6 right good wi-fi depends on good wired what does good wired look like if you rolling out in uh, wi-fi 6 deployment uh, 802.11 ax deployment well generally speaking you do not need more than one gigabit per second connection into an 802.11ax access point. Generally speaking, this should be more than enough. All right. Historically speaking, one one gigabit access points have been more than enough. Now most of our switches nowadays are one gigabit per second, so this has never been a problem, or certainly not for the the long long time. It hasn't been a problem, but. Um, and it probably is not going to be a problem for a very long time. But think about this when you do in an implementation. If your implementation has called for 802.11ax and you already have, you know, 100 gigabit per second um, um, or 100 megabit per second switching equipment in place, is your switching powerful enough to deliver the bandwidth that you need for 802.11x? right because by having um one gigabit connectivity into your access points especially 802.11ax or wi-fi 6 it can increase the bandwidth between the switch and the ap by two and a half times over legacy cable and 100 megabit per second networks the other thing that you need to consider is most Eight, uh, Wi-Fi 6 access points are 4x4x4, four by four by four, right? Four radios, four transmitters, um, etc., four antennas on these things. And when they operate at full capacity, <clears throat> you're going to need, if, if they are powered by PoE, 
um, they're going to you're going to need PoE plus, which means that you're going to have to feed 30 watts of power to power each one of these. So even though your existing infrastructure is OK, maybe you checked all of those things. If you're rolling out 802.11ax, consider that that because of the radius that they have on them, you're going to need 30 watts of power per. And if you look at your calculations, if your device doesn't support that, again, these are part of your project plan. But these are things just to think of, additional things to think of. Due to heat increase as well, with PoE++, um, we, we highly recommend CAT 6A solid copper cabling is recommended. OK, CAT 6 stranded patch cables are, are still OK. 802.11ax supports 2.4, but if possible, rather try and put those access points on the 5 or the 6 gigahertz bands. On episode three or four or five of course one when we spoke about um wireless uh no we when, when we spoke about power over ethernet we spoke about these standards so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on here other than saying to you power over ethernet comes in many different flavors and depending on what you are powering in wireless access points, depending on what you are powering, whether it's Extreme or one of those other gray guys, uh, companies, this is very important that you get right. OK, the amount of power that is going to run onto these devices. There's all sorts of standards. PoE plus, PoE plus, plus, 802. Uh, dot three is is the IE triple E standard for PoE. You get the A F the A P um, high power low power. Look at all of these things very very carefully. Right here's a table. Oh, you might want to screenshot that. And then, did you screenshot the previous one that I tell you to screenshot? If you haven't screenshot that, do that as well. Okay. And then let's go on to this one. Another one with tables. Please screenshot this because this will help you in your planning. OK, the devices. Look at this. For that type two. You know, you need four pairs, 60 watts. Typical if you're going to put in um, uh, if you're going to put in uh, security cameras, you know, this point, tilt, zoom, etc., etc. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been useful to you. Now, before I sign off, I have homework for you. You know those slides I asked you to, um, to, to screenshot? This is part of your homework. I want you to create a project plan, okay? It, I don't want it to be 25 pages, but I want this to be a discipline. I don't know if you can finish it by the time next week comes around, but have a go. Imagine you are you have been asked to create a project plan for a company. OK, imagine you've been asked to create a project plan. Let's call it a let's call it a junior school. Let's make it eight classrooms in the school, a hall and an office for teachers. OK, let's say that in total you have to run a wireless network to these five classes. You've got 50 students, 10 students in each class. You've got 10 teachers. Got it? Create a project plan and an outline a feasibility study to the best of your ability, a budget, right? You can make up values. You can make up numbers for access points. You can phone around. Maybe you want to try. Maybe you have this information. Basic access points doesn't have to be 802.11ax, but if you want to go 802.11, go and do some research. Use the web, use Extreme Networks website. Go and get this information. Do it as a discipline. Do it as a job that Isaac's given you. 
go through these bullet points step by step as you put it in your document step by step you will see an, an email address at the bottom that will appear on screen once you finish that save it as a pdf and send it to that email address and i'll go look at it it's not for points it's not for anything it's just for us to it's just for you to do something real with what you've learned today just to apply that discipline let me see what you are capable of let me see what level you are working at keep safe see you next week